There has been a rising tide of complaints by consumers claiming harassment over being searched by security guards at different stores. In what is considered a win for consumer rights, in August this year, the High Court in Francistown awarded a woman whose handbag was grabbed and searched by a security guard as she left a store 60,000 pula from a private security firm, an amount the judge felt was sufficient salatium for the humiliation, embarrassment and impairment of her dignity as an honest member of society that she had suffered. When the director of the security company in question gave evidence in response, he revealed that he understood their job as to look after their clients' goods and that he thought that security guards had a similar authority to that of the police, meaning that they could search individuals. In his ruling, the judge said the managing director did not know the circumstances when a legal search could be made. The same may apply to the very same guards guilty of this practice. And we suspect that the queues of Botswana consumers that we see lining up to be searched as they leave stores also don't know the circumstances when a legal search can be made. We attempt to rectify this lack of understanding this evening. Welcome to First Issues. Welcome to the program. Many consumers have come to accept the invasive search by store security guards of grocery bags and even personal backpacks and handbags as routine. But consumer rights activists say despite stores being private property with rights of admission and the like, this practice is plain wrong. Regular commentator and consumer advocate Kate Harriman helps us better understand what powers store security guards really have and what rights consumers have when confronted by this situation. I think there's a lot of misunderstanding over the legal rights that a security guard has. And I think there are two issues here. One is when you go into a store and the second is when you're leaving a store. Now, a lot of people complain about parcel counters that you, before you can go into certain stores, they want you to leave any shopping that you've got from another store at their parcel counter. And we're often asked, how safe is this? And we've heard of cases where things have gone missing and you've got no evidence to prove what was in your bag that you left at the counter. All you're doing is handing over a plastic bag or another bag and getting a ticket without any confirmation of the value of the item you're handing over um, or even what's in, in the bag or the condition. And a store are within their rights to refuse you entry because it is private property. So they can say, I'm sorry, you're not coming into this store with this bag. And often you'll find, um, you know, if you're carrying a laptop with you, you're out doing work, that a store will say you can't come in with that laptop. Now, obviously, you're, I would hope you're not going to leave your laptop and trust it to someone at a parcel counter. So some more responsible stores will actually say, OK, well, show us the item and you can, we'll put a sticker on it to show that it's yours and then you can come in and obviously we have the right to inspect it on the way out. Now, personally, I completely disagree with the whole idea of parcel counters. You know, why are you making customers feel like criminals before they've even walked in the door? I understand that stores have a, a lots of losses. They have people stealing. But do we need to punish every consumer because of the few that actually do? And surely there is a better way to actually manage security. If you look at even going to South Africa, we don't have the same situation where you go to, I don't know, Santon Shopping Centre and you can't walk into one store if you've been into another without leaving your goods. That doesn't happen. So they must have found a better way to deal with security. And I would urge our stores in Botswana to start trusting their customers more and finding a better way to deal with it. Especially as uh, you are liable for your own property at the parcel counters. Absolutely. And we've had cases where things have gone missing. And not just you know, a 20 Pula item. We've had cases where people have lost a 600 Pula item. And they've got no evidence to actually say, yes, I did hand this over and it was left at the parcel counter. So it's your word against theirs. And the store you know, can quite rightfully say, well, prove it. And you've got no proof. Uh, we even had one case where someone was asked to leave their handbag at the parcel counter because it was too big uh, and they weren't allowed to bring it into the store. My attitude is, thank you very much. Vote with your feet. If you don't like what you're getting before you even walk in the door, then go and shop somewhere else where you are treated with a little more respect and dignity. You said there was two parts to this. It's going in or being in the store and leaving. Now, leaving the store um, is an entirely different matter. 
And what a lot of people don't know is that security guards have no more powers than you and me. So they have no power to stop and search you. They have no power to ask you to open your bag or even to show you the till receipt and to go through the items in your trolley. And I'm sure we've all suffered at the hands of security guards who want to go through the items that you've just paid for, therefore they belong to you. So a guard only actually has a legal right of what's called a citizen's arrest. And they can only do that if they have reasonable and good suspicion that you've committed a crime. So if they've seen you taking an item and they have reason to believe that you haven't paid for it, they can detain you. But they have no right to search you. So they can't do anything other than say, I'm sorry, you're not going to leave the store unless we've actually investigated further. What they must then do is actually call the police who do have the right to search you, but a guard does not. And this has recently been upheld in the High Court in Botswana, where there was a judgment in August this year uh, determining that someone who'd been victim to this kind of procedure had been mistreated. And what had happened was that the customer had gone shopping in a large supermarket in Haberoni, and they had been physically detained at the point that they were leaving the store. Their handbag was grabbed from them, and it was searched without their consent. Now, this was in front of their children, uh, their friends. They even heard from their church that this had happened, um, that they'd been seen uh, being humiliated by a guard who'd overstepped the mark. And I think even guards misunderstand the law in this regard. But the, the, court, the High Court actually made it very clear that it's only a police officer that has the right to search you. Now, a few years back, we had, we've had two cases. One of a young woman, she was 17, and she went shopping in a clothes store in Haberoni. On the way out, the guard decided that he thought she had stolen a pair of shoes. He took her to the changing rooms and made her strip in front of him. Uh, where he thought she'd stuck the shoes down her skin-tight trousers, I have no idea. But because she didn't know her rights, she complied thinking that the guard has power, which he does not have. And needless to say, her parents were absolutely furious, and she was completely traumatised by the whole experience. We had another case very similar where a teacher was actually told to remove an item of clothing because the guard thought that she'd stolen something. And what guards need to understand is people's right to privacy but also the humiliation that they cause, particularly doing this in public. And you know, if you're going to detain someone, I think someone should be escorted to the manager's office out of sight of the public. You, know, you don't want 50 people standing around you saying, what's happened, what have they done? Um, so treat people with some humility um, and with some respect. But what's interesting is that the law now says you, you simply can't do this. And in the case that I just mentioned, uh, the woman in the supermarket, she actually won damages against the security company. What then should consumers do? Because this has become quite the culture. It's accepted. As you walk out the store, people rifle through your personal things. What should one do in that situation? Well, firstly, I think there is an element of racism and sexism on who gets stopped. And I don't have any specific evidence to support this right now, but we are doing some research on it. I think that black women tend to get stopped more often than black men or white women or, black, or, white, or white men. Um, so I think there is some discrimination going on on who gets stopped and that's perhaps to do with perceptions of power and who, who's going to be more likely to be amenable to being stopped. I do think it's become culture that we queue up to leave a store. Personally I never do um, because once you've paid for the item it now belongs to you. So it's not the store's item, it's your item. So do they have a right to see it? No they don't. If you want to stop and show the guard your handbag or show them what's in your plastic bag or let them search your trolley, then that's your choice. But you are within your powers. Unless they've got reasonable proof or suspicion that you've done something wrong, you have the right to say, I'm sorry, I'm not going to open my bag for you and I'm leaving. If a guard then insists that you're not going to leave because they think you've taken something, then ask them to call the police. And the police do have the power to search, but they do not. So I think it's important that we understand where the boundaries are and what our rights are. And you don't have to queue up to show them your parcel. I'm sure this is one where consumers are going to have to change the current order of things. I think so. And I think, you know, consumers need to understand they have rights and they have power. And that we shouldn't be frightened about using that power. And you are within your rights to stand there and say, no, I'm not, I'm not going to show you my bag. Call the manager. Call the police to come and investigate 
if someone insists that you, you open your bag. But I think once consumers say, no, enough is enough, we're not going to be treated like this, then stores will soon change their tune. Remember the power of the, uh, the money in your pocket. In the next segment of our program, we take a look at another way in which consumer trust is frequently abused. Welcome back. In this competitive world, members of the labour force are consistently upskilling themselves in an effort to increase their levels of employability and their ability to make a living. Others, however, try to beat the system. To attain opportunities and positions they have not put sufficient work, time and resources into. Going online and obtaining a fraudulent qualifications for jobs that need trained individuals and becoming weak links in the economic chain. It is a colossal and at times even a dangerous betrayal of trust when doctors, finance managers and decision makers within organizations turn out to be unqualified for the services they are meant to be providing, robbing us of the expertise we think we're paying for. So this evening, we find out how to discern which education certificates hanging on a wall or written on a CV we can trust and which are a blatant con. Richard Harriman educates us on how not to get an education. Your students, you students, let's talk about how to get an education. And this is where I get slightly heated. I'm not going to give you their names, but I can give you the names right now of six people who hold senior positions in society, in business, in Botswana, whose degrees and higher degrees are fake. This is just some of the fake universities that people use. I want to put about 12 up. None of these are real. They're nothing more than websites. And we've collected over the years probably 40 or 50 univers so-called universities that offer qualifications. They're not real. There's no building. There's no lecturer. There's no classroom. There's no assignments or exams or homework. There's no dissertations. There's nothing apart from a website that takes your credit card details. All of these offer diplomas, certificates, bachelor's degrees, master's degrees, and doctorates that are entirely fake. They're non-accredited universities, universities in quotes. They're not real at all. But you can go to them and you can have online conversations with, with them, saying, how long does it take? I went to one of them recently under an assumed name, saying, I'm a psychologist. And I want to be the head of the psychology department in my local children's department and the hospital, in the paediatrics department. I want to be in charge of that department as the lead psychologist dealing with troubled children. Can I get a PhD from you? Yes, of course you can. $1,500, you can have it next week. Now, if you have a fake degree in English literature, or you have a fake degree in something in the media. The worst thing that can happen is you get exposed eventually and you lose your job. If you have a fake degree and you become the head of child psychology in a hospital, or as some people have done, you get a nursing degree. Well, there was a case in South Africa a few years ago of a guy who got a degree in medicine who turned out to have got it on the internet and he was working in a hospital. In those situations, people can die. So it's just comprehensively dangerous and wrong. I also think that every time you find someone or encounter someone who's got a degree from a fake university, you must imagine, as people who are or have been students, you've just been slapped in the face. Because I'm guessing you're doing it the hard way. You've got assignments to do. You've got deadlines. You've got stress. You might fail. There's worry. There's concern. There's sleepless nights. There's all that work you have to do. Friends of mine who've done higher degrees, got PhDs, they went without sleep, without seeing their kids, and had to live in a foreign country for a long time. Sometimes not even a pleasant foreign country. They did it the hard way. Anyone who's got a degree from one of these establishments is a fake, 
And what's more, sooner or later, that's where they'll end up. Because if someone gets a, a job or a promotion as a result of a fake qualification, they're getting money on the basis of a lie. And that's fraud. That's a criminal offence. If you get a promotion, if you get a job, if someone gets that on the basis of a lie, first of all, they can be fired on the spot. No disciplinary hearings. No, 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 just out. Don't come back. And by the way, I'm calling the police because you've stolen my money. I've been paying you for a couple of years because I thought you had a degree. You claimed, you gave me a certificate from Rocheville University, which is fake. You've stolen my money and you can end up going to prison if you haven't killed someone first. I can also name a couple of people in Gabs who have been given awards. They've won awards. It's quite a common thing this time of year. Learn about this time of year. Emails start turning up saying, congratulations, I've had one. Congratulations, Mr. Harriman. You've won an award from the Biz Awards. This was a few years ago. Well, this is 2013, the latest one. But every year, these guys run this award scheme. And you get an award. That's fantastic. And you go, you spend a lot of money to go to somewhere exciting, like Dubai. One was in Paris, this one. And there's a huge ceremony. They hire a hotel, and it's fantastic. And there's champagne, and there's flowers, and there's photographers, and it's fake. And do you know how you can tell it's a fake? Look at the bottom left of the screen. You can nominate yourself. You can actually go to their website and say, I think I deserve an award. And then, of course, you have to pay to go to the ceremony. You have to pay to go to Paris. Of course, you have to pay the flights. You have to stay in the hotel they've chosen. You can't stay with your cousin's next door neighbor's brother who happens to live in Paris, you've got to stay in their hotel, the hotel they've booked, at the high rates. You've got to pay the flights. You've got to pay to get the ridiculous statuette and the medals and things. It's a scam. It's not a real award. I've now, one of my many fake identities is on a mailing list now from a company in the UK, claims to be in the UK, that awarded my fake identity. International Man of the Year 2013. Person doesn't exist, but it's still International Man of the Year. By the way, on the subject of fake qualifications, when it's a common thing a lot of newspapers have done in the States to expose these fake qualifications. They've, reporters have actually gone online and spent the money and got a fake degree without sitting any exams. And what they now do is they get their dog a degree or their cat a degree. That's how false it is if a dog can get a degree. If a dog can get an award, for being International Man of the Year, if a fake human being can get it, I think it shows you a lot about how legitimate they are. The one thing I've learned in business is that. Never be afraid to make mistakes. People who've not made mistakes in business aren't in business. People who've not made mistakes in their career haven't had a career. Every time I interview someone for a job, either here or from another organization, I say to them, what's your greatest success? What's the thing you're proudest of? And everyone's got something they're proud of. I then say, what's been your greatest failure? And the first test is, anyone who hasn't had a failure is either has never left their bedroom, is lying, or they're insane. And either way, I don't want to employ them. And critically, you learn from mistakes, hopefully. That man made more mistakes than anyone else in business history. Yes, I'm doing this from an iPad and with an iPhone, and there's a Mac in the other room, there's Macs at home everywhere. I'm an Apple through and through. But Steve Jobs more, made more mistakes in business than anyone remembers. Do you remember the Apple Cube, the Apple Newton, the Apple Lisa? No? Never heard of them? They all had enormous launches, as big as the iPhone launch, and they all completely bombed. The first iPhone was horrible, just dreadful, but didn't stop him. Carried on and learnt from those mistakes. 
And that's a quote from the man, from Steve Jobs, about mistakes. That no one in Apple is fired for making a mistake. No one in a good company is fired for making a mistake. You make too many, obviously, then that's a different issue. But never be afraid to make a mistake. Because that's on the only way that you learn. You don't learn from successes. You get pride from successes. You learn from making mistakes. It is now time for the stock market review, courtesy of the Botswana Stock Exchange. A very good evening to you all, and from all of us at the Botswana Stock Exchange, compliments of the new season. Here's hoping that we're all well rested and ready to take on the new year. Let's have a look at last week's capital market statistics. The domestic companies index, DCI, was up by 0.31%, whilst the foreign companies index, FCI, was up by a marginal 0.01%. Total turnover for the week was 16.7 million pula, a daily average of 3.3 million pula, and the total number of shares traded last week was 6.1 million. If you look at the exchange traded funds, ETFs, the Better Beta ETF ended the week at 38 Bula 30, whilst the New Gold ETF ended the week at 108 Bula 70 Tebe. As we all know, the year 2013 was a good year for our local capital markets as we had a record 2.1 billion Bula in turnover. Here's hoping that this year will yield similar, if not much better, results. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your evening. We thank you for joining us this evening. From me, Nameto Sibina, the team behind First Issues, and our sponsors, First National Bank, we wish you a good night and pleasant viewing. <laughs>